Gamarjoba, my name is Roberto, and I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time to check out my podcast, The History of Sacatvelo, Georgia. I'm both sorry and happy to report that this beautiful and fascinating country is, to my great surprise, criminally underrated in the history world. So, let us celebrate this beautiful land by coming with me on this journey from prehistory to the present day, right here at the History of Sacatvelo, Georgia. You can find us on our website, historyofsacatvelo.com, or on Twitter at history underscore Georgia. Now back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, the Ashanti army once again triumphed over the British in the Second Anglo-Ashanti War, with their largest rival reeling and largely abandoning their sovereignty over coastal Ghana, and the Ashanti economy once again recovering to a state of normalcy, things seem to be improving for the Ashanti Empire, and the future seems bright. But nothing could be further from the case. To foreshadow a bit, we are now entering the Ashanti Empire's twilight years. Starting with today's episode, the contradictions that have plagued the empire from its beginning, as well as a fresh set of new challenges that will emerge from global and political economic shifts, will conspire to destroy the Ashanti Empire. Season 3, Episode 21 The Rise of Kofi Kakari The closing years of Kwakojoa's long reign as Ashantahene was one of the most confounding and complex times in the empire's history. As of the year 1866, Kwakajoa had ruled the Ashanti Empire for more than three decades. And I want to pause to consider just how long this rule is, especially from the perspective of the prototypical Ashanti bureaucrat. Ashanti bureaucrats became officially recognized after completing a long apprenticeship under an experienced Nsapohene. This could take several years, and most people started the apprenticeship in their late teens, completing it by their mid-twenties or early thirties. So, by the end of Kwakojoa's 33-year-long reign, many of the bureaucrats, linguists, and soldiers serving the king's government were born as subjects of Kwakojoa, trained as subjects of Kwakojoa, and then served lengthy public careers under Kwakojoa. In the mid-19th century, the global life expectancy was a little under 40. Given how low life expectancies were around the world in the mid-19th century, it wasn't uncommon for people to be born, grow up, live, and then die, all within the rulership of Ashantahene Kwakojoa. And throughout his rule, Kwakojoa was no figurehead. He dominated the Ashanti state with an unprecedented degree of despotism. The institutions of the Kotoko, Ashante Manshiamu, and Ampanyimfo, as well as the regional Amanhenes, became increasingly irrelevant in Ashanti statecraft. Rather, Kwakojoa used the military, once a politically neutral arm of the Ashanti government, as his main ally. By the latter years of his reign, Kwakojoa's empire recalled not the image of the constitutional monarchy of the past, but a military dictatorship. It was he, not the old institutions of the Ashanti, who commanded the empire's legislative, judicial, and military power. Having the absolute power of state flow through the personality of one man may increase the efficiency of state decision-making, but it comes with the caveat of mankind's eternal flaw our mortality. In the closing days of his life, the king had ordered one final campaign. In response to a group of Talensi people, a group to the Ashanti's northwest, raiding Ashanti settlements along the Volta banks, an Ashanti army marched east across the Volta to crush them. The general traveled to the Volta region to oversee the campaign. But one day, while taking a ride in his palanquin back to Kumasi, the aging Ashantahene suddenly fainted. He quickly recovered from this episode, but this was clearly a sign that something was wrong with the king's health. Over the next few weeks, the king became increasingly ill. The best and brightest priests and medics from around the Ashanti Empire tried to cure the Ashantahene, but to no avail. Despite his illness, the king refused to rest and demanded that he be allowed to continue his regular governing duties. In fact, on April 26th of 1867, the king arose from his bed and spent several hours delivering legal opinions, as though there was nothing wrong with him. In the evening, he attended several religious festivals and visited the royal mausoleum to pay homage to the Ashantahenes of the past. Then, at midnight, Saturday, the 27th of April, 1867, the Ashantahene Kwakojoa passed away. The following morning, in a somber procession, Kwakojoa's corpse was treated with various preservative chemicals, and then laid in state in the courtyard of the Ashanti royal palace for several days, before it was transported to the royal mausoleum where he was displayed on the steps. 
Onlookers cried in remorse, and sang dirges in memory of the deceased monarch. Ashanti customs dictate that it is taboo to make direct reference to the death of a king, so the doleful voices declared their misery at his departure, absence, or silence, but never his death. One of the Ashanti hymns sang of a nobleman's sadness at how, in the king's absence, the Ashanti nation could no longer rely on his protection. It was as if a child was losing their father. The Asantehane has put down his umbrella. We shall be scorched to death by the sun. Oh, you know the condition in which you have left me. See to it that there is rain so that I can collect some of it to drink. If you send me a gift, send me a crocodile's liver, which I can eat raw if I cannot make a cooking fire. Nobody knew it yet, but in a sense, you could say that these hymns not only mourned the death of their king, but ominously mourned the coming death of their empire, society, and civilization. But funerary hymns were soon drowned out by the sounds of gunfire and screams. Marking the end of the ceremony, the king's enslaved death row inmates, the Acheri, were murdered in a flurry of executions. This was not unusual, and normally this would have been achieved in an orderly manner. But the unexpected nature of the king's demise had ensured that the head executioner and leader of the palace guard, known in Chui as the Adumhene, had no time to organize an orderly killing. The Adumhene, a man by the name of Aji Chesi, took matters into his own hands. Fortunately for Chesi, the Achieri slaves had not been informed of the king's death as to dissuade escape attempts. Around 200 of the Achieri were summoned to the royal palace for a special cleaning assignment before they were locked in and slaughtered by the palace guards. Not all of the Achieri had been in the palace though. Some had been running errands throughout the city, or in a few cases, some had even seen through Chessy's ruse and tried to flee. The palace guards dispersed throughout Komasi, tracking down and killing the Achieri. The people of Komasi were caught by surprise by this violence. The execution of Achieri was a familiar practice that anyone would be familiar with the existence of, but due to the long lifespan of Kwakojoa, nobody had actually seen it happen in three decades. Not to mention, if people had seen it happen, they were used to seeing it take the form of an orderly series of pre-planned execution, nothing like the seemingly random acts of violence taking place throughout the city. The citizens of Kumasi had no idea what was going on. Had order collapsed with the Ashantahene's death? Was this the first step of a succession dispute, or God forbid, a civil war? Panic ensued throughout the city. Civilians fled their homes, abandoning their possessions in an effort to reach safety. Some tried to take a stand, attacking the palace guards. This, however, only made things worse, as then the palace guards began to fight back, attacking and killing civilians along with Achieri. That night, seeing quickly that things were getting out of hand, the other members of the Kotoko Council had urged Chessy to end the violence, but to no avail. The massacre intensified the following day, as some of the city's more opportunistic residents decided to steal the abandoned property of those who had fled. Others took to looting market stalls. The city's public bath, the Ayakaseajo, was the site of the worst massacre on the second day of violence, with more than a dozen people killed by roving gangs of palace guards. Reprieve from the bloody massacre finally came on the 29th. Kwakojoa's corpse was, at long last, buried in the mausoleum. The roving bands of palace guards, figuring that the period of mourning had come to an end, laid down their arms and returned to the palace as though nothing had happened. Within a few days, the weary people of Komasi gradually trickled back into their homes, hoping that things had finally calmed down. According to the diary of Musa Datari, an Ashanti slave who had been present in Komasi during the massacre, the violence in Komasi took the lives of, by his estimates, more than 3,000 people. So, what had actually happened to provoke this massacre in Komasi in the first place? Was it, as European observers characterized it, a showcase of the violent barbarism of Ashanti human sacrifice? Well, no. Remember, this riotous attack was completely abnormal. It did not resemble at all the traditional Ashanti system of ritualized criminal execution that foreigners often labeled as sacrifice. Not to mention, the entire tragedy had occurred over the objections of the rest of the Kotoko Council. The motive was, likely, political. Nobody was willing to admit it with the king's corpse still above ground, as it would be seen as disrespectful, but Kwakojoa's death had clearly opened up a power vacuum and everybody knew it. In my opinion, this wanton killing doesn't resemble anything like human sacrifice, but appears more like a power play by the Adomhene and the palace guard. If political power flows from the barrel of a gun, these attacks were Chessy's assertion that, 
in this brave new world without Kwakojoa, he was the one who controlled the guns of Komasi, and therefore, he controlled political power. In this atmosphere of tension, the Ashante Manhyamu convened to elect a new Ashante Hene. Kwakojoa had not designated an heir during his reign. In fact, he had been intentionally vague in who he sought to replace him. Some scholars have speculated that Kwakojoa was trying to create his own patrilineal dynasty in violation of Ashanti cultural norms, in which his son would become the next Ashantehene after he died, and then his son, and then his son, and that this plan was only stopped by his premature death. So, who would replace the king was an open question. Well, sort of. You see, two factions would emerge that would disagree with that last statement. Each of them claimed that the Ashantahene actually had assigned a successor on his deathbed. The first faction was led by a nobleman and prestigious military leader named Owosu Koko. Owosu, who you might remember from two episodes back, was the military general and Amonhene of the Achem province, in whom Kwakojoa had entrusted a great deal of the running of the Ashanti state. He was also a descendant of the old Ashantahene Ose Bonso, making him a member of the once all-powerful Konadoan dynasty. Owosu claimed that Kwakojoa had never actually sought to overthrow the Konodoans at all, but had rather intended to act as a placeholder regent between the rule of Oseyakoto and the next viable member of the Konodoan dynasty. With his dying breath, Kwakojoa had declared that Owosu's grandson, the seven-year-old Ajiman Kofi, was his true heir apparent. Is the story true? Absolutely not. In private correspondence, Kwakojoa made it incredibly clear that he did not see himself as a placeholder regent for anyone, but as the start of a new branch of the Ashanti royal dynasty. Not to mention, if he had just been waiting for a viable successor from the Konodoan bloodline to come around, he could have just, you know, abdicated in favor of Owosu himself. But he didn't. But even though this story isn't fooling anyone, even 150 years later, it was enough of a justification for Owosu to put his grandson's hat in the ring in terms of who would become the next Ashantehene. The other faction rallied behind the claim of the Ashantehema, a woman by the name of Afuakobi. Afuakobi had a complex relationship with the now past Ashantehene, Kwakojoa. It's not even exactly clear if she was even technically a member of the Ashanti dynastic family. Her main connection to the royal family came through a marriage to Kwakojoa's paternal half-brother. And remember, since Ashanti inheritance is traditionally matrilineal, Marrying the king's paternal half-brother might as well be marrying the king's janitor in terms of Ashanti dynastic politics. Apart from that, her main link to the Ashanti royal family was that she was descended from a previous Ashanti Hema, but one who had never produced an heir who took power. In fact, Afua Kobe's relatively weak claim to the Ashanti Hema position was exactly why Kwakojoa decided to appoint her in the first place. Kwakojoa had even gone so far as to try and induce Afua Kobe to try to make an heir that she would not seek to place one of her own children on the golden stool when he died. Remember, his plan was to place one of his paternal grandsons on the golden stool. So by selecting Afua Kobe with her tenuous relationship to the royal family as a Shantahema, Kwakojoa was basically setting up his speculative heirs with a weaker rival. The problem was, none of those paternal grandchildren had been, you know, born yet. There was one viable heir, the old king's infant maternal grandnephew, Kwakojoa II. By the laws of Ashanti succession, it was pretty clear that this infant boy should become the next ruler of Ashantiman, but he was, you know, an infant. So, for the moment, someone else would have to rule, acting as a regent until Kwakojoa II was old enough to rule in his own right. Afua Kobe, on the other hand, was a more prolific mother, having two adult sons. Sensing an opportunity, Afua Kobe submitted her own candidate for consideration, her eldest son, Kofi Kakari. Kofi Kakari, or as he's sometimes called in the literature, Kofi Kari Kari, is somewhat of an enigmatic figure before 1867. A 30 year old man at the time, Kakari's defining characteristic was his experience as a sidelined but present member in Ashanti elite social circles. He wasn't exactly someone who screamed next king of Ashantiman, but he wasn't an Oseyakoto like figure either. He wasn't a party animal who was out getting drunk or someone who committed regular criminal acts. It's just that in terms of elite Ashanti social circles, he was something of a wallflower. Of course, like in every Ashanti election, there was a lot more going on here than meets the eye. Had the election been a purely principled debate over who had a more legitimate claim to the throne, well, there would be no debate. Afua Kobe was the Ashantehema, and therefore her son, Kofi Kakari, 
should be the next Ashanti Hene in the absence of a more viable candidate. That's not going to change just because one guy says, no, no, I totally heard the king say that my grandson should be king. Like, trust me, bro. That's what we like to call an open and shut case. But... Of course, this wasn't a principled debate over legitimacy, it was a political debate over who should have power. The true question that determined where people stood on the issue of succession was not who had the more legitimate claim, nor was it really even how they felt about Owosukoku and Afua Kobe, it was how they felt about everything that had happened in the last 30 years. The debt relief program, the high estate taxes, the absolutist dictatorship, the war with the British, the massacre in Komasi, these were all on people's minds. Owosu Koko, as a close ally and longtime confidant of Kwako Joa, was an embodiment of the status quo. And yeah, there were some members of the Ashanti elite who were okay with that, but many were not. They were tired of having their autonomy stripped away, tired of the perpetually growing power of the Ashantahani in the military, and tired of the heavy taxation. Riding the wave of this anti-military backlash, Afwa Kobe and her son emerged as winners. Kofi Kakari was now the 10th Ashantahene. In a climate as unstable as 1867 Komasi, however, victory in an election was no guarantee of victory. Kofi Kakari and his mother had to act fast, before Owosu's deep-seated connections in the military played to his advantage. Immediately, Owosu himself, as well as his allies, were seized as prisoners by the pro-Kobi faction, while Kakari himself made a dash to the royal palace to seize physical possession of the Golden Stool. Despite having the appearance of an election, the conclusion of the day's proceedings resembled more a coup d'etat than the glorious rise of a new king. However, even with the golden stool now in his possession, it's not like Kakari could completely count on the state to remain loyal to him. The military was a particularly troublesome part of the government. Not only was the military obviously the most dangerous part of the government to be disloyal, they did command the greatest ability to utilize force, after all, but the military was the most independent branch of the Ashanti civic system. Traditionally, the commander-in-chief of the Ashanti military was the Kontihene, or Minister of Defense. But as a part of the general trend of declining Kotoko power, the Kwakojoa period saw an increasing degree of power shift away from the Kontihene, and greater autonomy awarded to generals and commanders within the army's ranks. In terms of the military, Kakari had no guarantee of loyalty. Despite the violence in Komasi, the palace guards seemed to be loyal enough. Chessy was himself an opponent of Kwakojoa's reforms, and therefore supported Kakari's rise to power. But this was nowhere near large enough a force to govern an empire, or fight off a rebellion. Not only did just about every army commander possess deep-seated ties to the old king Kwakojoa, but they also had strong connections with Owosu. You know, the politician who Kakari and his mother had just jailed. However, not everyone in the military was so ardently opposed to Kakari's rise. In fact, to some of the more opportunistic members of the army, the rise of the Ashantahene was not a threatening development, but a promising one. While most of the military elites were outraged, Kakari and Kobe managed to get into contact with a few of the less scrupulous generals. In particular, two generals emerged as Kakari's allies, who, in just about every other way, couldn't be more different. One was a promising young general by the name of Otto Beaufort. In 1867, Beaufort had earned renown in battle not once, but twice. In the Talensi War, as well as crushing a rebellion in the frontier city of Pekki, he had proven himself to be a capable battlefield commander, despite coming from a relatively obscure lineage that could barely be called nobility. For a leader like Beaufort, who had just so recently become prominent, the rise of an insecure king like Kakari presented an opportunity for advancement. In exchange for Beaufort's support in the military, Kakari promised him a major promotion. Not only would he retain command of his army, but he would be elevated to the position of Jasehene, or finance minister. An offer for a position on the Kotoko Council was, well, rare to say the least, and too good of an offer for Beaufort to pass up. Kakari's other emerging ally was a man by the name of Aman Kwasha IV, and he was Beaufort's opposite in every way, for better or worse. While Beaufort was a young upstart, Aman Kwasha was an elderly, longtime veteran of the army. While Beaufort's familial background was mostly irrelevant, Aman Kwasha came from one of the most powerful and renowned families in the Ashanti Empire, which included, yes, the earlier Aman Kwasha, the Ashanti Kontehene, who had led them to victory at the Battle of Nsamanko during the First Anglo-Ashanti War. 
While Beaufort had never held a civilian government position prior to his deal with Kakari, Aman Kwasha was an Amanhene, and not only that, the Amanhene of one of the most populous and wealthy neighborhoods of Kumasi. And most importantly of all, while Beaufort was a no-nonsense, incredibly capable leader, Aman Kwasha IV was a notorious alcoholic and just a generally uncharismatic guy. He was not stupid or incompetent by any means, and was actually quite an effective tactician, he was just kind of a pain to get along with. But his personality wasn't what mattered here, because ensuring the loyalty of Aman Kwasha meant ensuring the loyalty of the soldiers he commanded. So, in exchange for loyalty, Aman Kwasha was given the position of Conte Hene. So, Aman Kwasha II was given a seat on the Kotoko Council. I can't find any reference to a specific title he was given, so it seems he was just kind of made into a personal exception, and everyone just kind of understood that Aman Kwasha is allowed to stick around during council meetings, even if he doesn't have an official title. Now that these new, loyal military elites occupied positions on the Kotoko, Kakari opted to revamp the council's power. To earn the loyalty of the other members of the council, Kakari promised a sort of restoration of Kotoko authority. He promised that, unlike his predecessor, he would always consult the Kotoko before making major decisions. In fact, coupled with his non-restoration of the equally eroded power of the imperial legislature, the re-empowered Kotoko would be the most powerful they had been since, well, maybe ever. Now that he had secured the loyalty of a large portion of the military, Kakari began his plan to truly secure power over the Ashanti state, a purge of the army. Backed up by the ranks of his allies, Kakari initiated a purge of Ashanti military leadership. He relieved any generals who had a connection to Kwakojoa or Owosu, so, you know, most of them, from their duty. Others, especially those in the established nobility, were won through more persuasive means. To ingratiate himself with the empire's wealthiest classes, Kakari took to abolishing many of his predecessors' less popular policies, including a lowering of the unpopular state tax. Bribes were also common. But any strategy involving carrots needs sticks as well. Any generals who decided to resist this military takeover were straight up executed. And just like that, within a few months of taking power, the Ashanti military was completely at Kakari's disposal. The Ashanti state was, once again, a more or less functioning government. So, by the end of the tumultuous year, 1867, Kakari had secured unquestionable control over the Ashanti state. The problem was that, through this process of securing control, Kakari ensured that the empire he ruled was a shell of its former self. For starters, its military was enormously crippled. Many of its most competent leaders were either imprisoned or executed during Kakari's purge. The abolition of the previous administration's estate tax rapidly dried up a major portion of the empire's revenue, leading to cuts in both military and domestic spending. So, to save funds, even many of the most competent bureaucrats and generals who had survived Kakari's purge were unceremoniously laid off. The Ashanti economy also took several steps back during Kakari's early reign. The declining state budget due to the abolition of the estate tax meant that promises of debt fulfillment couldn't be repaid, so the number of Ashanti peasants in debt peonage once again started to expand. The expensive purchase of cowries from European merchants also became less frequent, and deflation of the currency resumed. And on top of the reappearance of all of these preventable economic problems, a series of bad agricultural fortunes rocked rural Ashantiman. For reasons that aren't exactly clear, soon after Kakari's instalment, crop failures became rampant throughout the Ashanti Empire. Perhaps this was caused by bad weather, soil erosion, or maybe even outbreaks of agrarian diseases like dry rot, a species of nematodes that infects yams and renders them inedible. Regardless of the cause, these crop failures caused a major decline in Ashanti agricultural productivity, as well as a decline in the Ashanti peasantry's confidence in their new government. To the Ashanti, it must have felt like the Abbasom themselves were abandoning the empire to a terrible fate. And, well, things are not going to get better from here. Just a few years after his ill-fated reign began, Kakari would be thrust into a war against the Ashanti's age-old enemies, the British Empire. However, something will have changed since our last two explorations of conflicts between the British and Ashanti empires. The British will possess two enormous advantages, the factory and the steamship. Join us next episode as we explore what happened between 1870 and 1873 to put the Ashanti and British empires back on the warpath. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, 
and we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Penza, Tobias Tunglin, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, BB Milliam, and Conrad Schwenke, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really means 